guys can go ahead and, and grab a seat. Good morning again. It's, it's a great opportunity for us to be able to, to be together, to, to jump into God's word together. This morning, as, as always, we're trying to, to seek to worship Jesus together and in a way that's going to, to bring pleasure and, and glory to him and to, to him alone. Um, this morning, I want to remind you of Psalm chapter 118 and, and, and verse 24. Here's what, what this passage says, and this is something that I've been thinking through today, even as we have this opportunity to be able to gather. It says, this is the day the Lord has made. Maybe you've thought about that passage before recently, and the rest of it says, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Even in this season when we get to come together and to gather together as the people of God, sometimes we can easily forget that we can rejoice in the opportunity to be able to come together to worship Jesus, even despite a long week, a, a hard week, maybe there's some things that you've went through this week or been thinking about that's been weighing you down in, in some ways. Maybe it's been frustrating to you a little bit. Maybe you, you see the, the turmoil in the culture around us, the, the chaos in the world around us. And you're saying, God, what are you doing? But sometimes we need that reminder that this is the day that the Lord has made and we can still rejoice and be glad in it, even despite what is happening around us, because th- this is the reality. Brokenness is inevitable around us. But as the people of God, we get to rejoice that God is still in his throne, that he is still in control. I know this is a season that might not be ideal for you, but we have an ideal God who made today. He's the one that's sitting over today and he's going to bring about his good purposes still. So we need to trust him in this season. It's a hard season, but even when you stay united as we move forward, even as tension is high. If you have your Bibles with me this morning, turn with me to Galatians chapter 4. I'm going to be in verses 21 through 31 this morning. We've been continuing our sermon series in the book of Galatians. We've been talking about this idea of finding freedom. And in our text this morning, we're coming to a passage of Scripture that is, is hard for people to read at times and to understand. Because one of the main reasons is, is that it, it is written with the Old Testament. And when we come to read the New Testament, sometimes we're not thinking uh, cognitively about, okay, we need to consider what the Old Testament says in light of this passage. And in this passage, there's so many different parallels and illustrations and, and imagery that, that the author is trying to get to us. And so it could be hard for some, but here's the thing. God has something for us in this passage this morning. And so we have to trust him. We have to believe him in that. We have to do the work to understand what the Old Testament is saying in light of this biblical passage. Here's what the word of the Lord says. It reads as this. It says, tell me, You who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free of the free woman was born through the promise. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. And now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and she corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren one, who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. I want to tag this text for our exchange this morning, fighting legalism by the supernatural power of God. And you might be saying, okay, I didn't see the word legalism there. So you might be wondering, is the text really trying to, to get at that idea? Well, we need to read scripture with scripture. We need to understand that Paul is building an argument here. And he's tr- uh, trying to share an illustration here in this chapter. He's turning the corner in his conversation to get to the, the practical implications of this idea that justification comes through faith alone. And so what he had, had done in chapters 3 and, and 4 and into 5, what he's trying to do is he's trying to build this case that we need to understand that, that freedom only comes through Christ and Christ alone. Freedom doesn't come through the law. It doesn't come from legalistic activity, but it comes through trusting the glorious news of 
the gospel. That's where the freedom comes from. The, the main idea of this passage this morning is this idea. Freedom in Christ is a supernatural work of God. And legalism is a natural work of man. Let me say that one more time for us. Freedom in Christ is a supernatural work from God. And legalism is a natural work of man. Sometimes it's so easy for us to get it twisted. We understand this idea that we are first made new through the supernatural transformative power of Jesus, but we so quickly move on into legalistic activity and start building our faith on the work of man. We're not relying upon the work of the Spirit to help us in moving forward as followers of Jesus. And that's what we're going to see here in our text. And so this leads us to point number one this morning. Legalism boasts in the natural. Legalism boasts in the natural. Paul begins this portion of his letter by posing a question to a growing group of legalists in Galatia. He says, if someone desires to be under the law, then do you not listen to the law? He's saying, if you want to be really this legalistic, if you want to hold to it, the law in this way, shouldn't you fully submit yourself to the law? Shouldn't you not try to, to run, to flee from the law, but you should seek to be perfect in your obedience? He's speaking to the legalist and all of us because we all have this legalistic tendency that can well up inside of us that we don't even realize at times. And what he's trying to get at here is that if you're going to represent this type of living, you better do it in a very perfect way. Legalism is our natural response to obeying the law. It's the people pleaser inside of us. And you might be saying, okay, how does that mean that I'm the people pleaser? Uh, well, you're a people pleaser because hopefully you want to obey God. And in your desire to obey God, you uh, will apply more pressure to yourself. And so when you mess up, you will struggle because you're saying, well, I'm not, I'm not meeting the means. I'm not measuring up. I'm not becoming the person that God wants me to be. And so you allow the weight and the pressure of the law to weigh you down. It's the people pleaser in you. And when that's you, you struggle to rest in grace. Even in the moments you mess up, it's okay when you mess up. But you need to rest in the grace of the cross. Rest there. See, it's our temptation to want to be doers that we become these legalistic people throughout time. But it's all rooted within a right desire, right? We want to honor God, but sometimes our hearts can be off in that desire to honor God. Paul continues on to share how living under the law is a product of the nature or the natural, and that living by the promises of God is the product of the supernatural. He gives two pathways here in this text for the ways that um, someone can be clinging to the promises of God through the supernatural, or they could seek to build life on their own works. He gives Abraham as the example of this in this passage. This reminds us to the text we've come to a few times in this sermon series, Galatians chapter 12, verse 2. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and, and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Abraham heard those, those glorious words. He heard that in the uh, coming from God, and God told him that he was going to bless him and make him a great nation. But Abraham at some point became restless about that. He said, God, you've told me you're going to do this work, but it's not happening as fast as I, I want it to. He, he became restless. Maybe that's you right now in this season. Maybe there's some things that you want in your life right now that you believe that God is, has in store for your future. That you know that's where he, he wants to take you to. But what happens when it's not happening in the way that you want it to? What happens to when you know that you have the promises that are coming to you from God, but it doesn't work out the way that you want it to? Are you going to just work it out by your own hands? See, God promised Abraham that he would provide for him an heir. So Abraham, he lacked faith in this moment, and he decided to take matters into his own hands. Friends, how often have you taken matters into your own hands? When would we uh, start to understand that we can't do things on our own, but we need to rest in God's hands? See, Paul shares the story of Abraham and his wives and his sons to show us what happens when we take matters into our own hands. Is that you this week? Have you been trying to bring about change in the world or in your own life through your own hands? Or have you been resting upon the Spirit of God to, to help you along the way? In verse 22, Paul recounts the story of Sarah and Hagar, and he clearly distinguishes the two of them, and he says, one, Sarah is referring to the free, and then Hagar is referring to the slave. Why, why would he give this type of illustration here? Well, we need to understand this Old Testament passage to understand what's happening. First, Abraham and Sarah had unsettled hearts. 
They, they were struggling to, to trust the promises of God. Remember, God told them he's going to make them a great nation, a great people. Well, the heir wasn't coming quickly enough for them. So Sarah feels like she's being prevented from, from childbearing. We see that in Genesis chapter 16, verse 2. Therefore, she offers up her slave, Hagar, to Abraham to provide the promised offspring. So just think about how, how wrong this could go for a moment. Nothing could go right here, you know. They're not getting what they want. And so they say, God, well, you promised me you're going to do something supernatural in my life. You're going to bring about this, this great plan, this great blessing. But it's not happening how I want it to. So Sarah looks at Abraham and is like, okay, come on, brother. Like, we, we got to do something here. And Abraham is like, ah, I don't know. And, and then he goes and, and, I mean, well, she goes and says, well, what about Hagar? What, what if we just go down and get her from the quarters and bring her up here and maybe we can then have our offspring. They took matters into their own hands. Friends, anytime we take matters into our own hands, everything goes smoothly, right? No, it doesn't. Maybe that was you this week. Think about it. You, you try to do things yourself, and it does not go the way that maybe you intended it to, but what would happen if you just waited on God? Abraham and Hagar conceived their son Ishmael, and and, and Abraham believes that the promises of God are being fulfilled in this moment. It's interesting here because him and God have a little conversation that we'll get to in a few moments, but it, it's pretty interesting to think that they thought that that was it. They thought that they could bring it about. They didn't need God, but they, they could do it themselves. Abraham and Sarah boasted in their natural ability to change their circumstance. They were not willing to wait on the supernatural God to change them, but they needed to do them, do it themselves. Friends, legalists do not wait on the supernatural. They trust the natural. And, that, and there's a connection here for us in this passage that the, the legalists in us tend to do things ourselves and bring it about ourselves, and we don't wait on God. Friends, are you more confident in your hands or in God's hands? Do, do you trust God more than you? Do you need to be the one that just orchestrates your future about? Now, I'm not saying you should just wait and do nothing, but or do you trust God to bring about his good plans? Are you just trying to shove God along the way? If you're wise enough to think that you can just shove God along the way, you're sadly mistaken because that's what Abraham tried to do in this moment because God comes back to him and he begins to reiterate his covenant with him. He says, look, I still have my plan to make you a people. I have an everlasting covenant for you and for your offspring. Imagine that's grace, right? You go take matters into your own hands. God comes to you and says, no, I'm still establishing this covenant with you. God was still remaining faithful to him, even though Abraham did not understand. Even though Abraham tried to do all that he could to put the team on his back. How many times have you tried to put the team on your back to get things done? You didn't trust the spirit of God to, to work and to move. No, you need people around you to help you to move forward. You need God to help you to be faithful. Friends, it's easy to tell at times when you're running on low, when you're just doing it on your own. The people around you might be noticing because you're crumbling right now. Maybe you've done a better job than others. You've been doing a good job of kind of putting up the, uh, the facade, you know, the, the good imagery. Oh, yeah, I got it all together right now. But it's different when you're relying upon the Spirit. It's interesting here in this text because Abraham got Ishmael without relying upon God, but God wanted him to trust the supernatural. See, Abraham looked at God, and he said, I got this. How many times have you looked at God and said, I got this? Think about it. Maybe even this week. Maybe within the relationships that you have, you've been trying to do this on your own accord. Trust God. You might be saying, okay, well, why is Isaac so special why was a child of a promise a, a supernatural reality? Didn't it just come natural as well? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked me. Well, first is this. Sarah was about 90 years old at this time. Abraham was about 100 years old at this time. Sarah laughed at the idea of being able to give birth in these moments. C could you just imagine that? Like, God's like, oh, I got a promise. I'm going to fulfill through you. Yeah, you're going to have a, a blessed offspring. She's like, I'm 90. I mean, I think we all know science a little bit better than that. And so that's all I'll say. But like, it's, she's thinking there like, what's going on? But the supernatural is greater than the natural. God can work despite the natural. And so in this moment, it would have been so easy for them to just, just to, to rely upon themselves. God showed them, no, I'm a promise-keeping God. I can fulfill my promises. 
So in spite of their shallow faith, God tells them that they will have a son. Their son Isaac would be the fulfillment of the promises of God. God didn't want them to rely upon themselves. They wanted, he wanted him, them to trust him. So here is why Paul references Ishmael was born uh, of the flesh and Isaac was born of the promise. He's making a correlation between the illegalist um, to, and those who were born of the flesh and Isaac being born to the promise and the people that are free in Jesus living for him, clinging to the promises of God. When you boast in your own ability, you are taking credit away from God and you're giving it to yourself not God's work on your behalf. Friends, what are you doing? Are you taking the credit for the work that you're doing or are you actually resting in God? See, legalists do a great job talking about their worship of God. I do all of these right things, you know. I, I'm so faithful. I'm so committed to God. You know, I'm so committed to the task. However, their actions, their own actions are at the center of the conversation. It's not their own worship of God. It's not their own desire to find delight in him, to know and to love him. They focus on the do's and don'ts. For followers of Jesus, there's nothing we can do out of the natural, but the supernatural power of God is all that we need. We have no room to boast in our flesh. We only can boast in the spirit because it's God who works. I can only imagine what was going through Abraham and Sarah's mind afterwards. They probably were just reflecting back on what had happened. They're thinking, only God could do this. Have you had one of those moments maybe lately or in the past where you said, man, only God could do this. Only he could work this out, bring these things about. You couldn't do it on your own, but God could. That leads me to point number two this morning. The supernatural power of God is greater than legalism. We'll see this in verses 24 through 28. But we first need to understand that the purpose here of this argument, he's saying that I want you to understand that if you are going to be legalistic in your living, you need to be a faithful legalist. You need to be a good one. But Paul uses this allegory to make this this illustration for us because he discusses two possible covenants that the Galatians could be participants in. So for Paul, he knew that the Galatians wanted to be sons of Moses, but he questioned that they were actually sons of Abraham. And that's something we really need to think through for a moment because when people become so legalistic, they're saying, oh, well, it's all about the law. It's all about the law. They move beyond the the promises of God that are interconnected. They're connecting us to him. So when we only make much of certain portions, we'll miss out on actually following Jesus in the heart of clinging to the promises of God. This is why Paul continues to refer back to Abraham through the book, because God first makes his promise to Abraham, and God still desires to fulfill that covenant with him. Even though the Galatians wanted to point back to Moses as their source, Paul saying, no, no, you need to go back to Abraham because God is doing a supernatural work and the law was, was created so that you would rely upon the supernatural work of God. It was to point you towards him because you need God to even to measure up because you can't do it on your own. For example, here, Paul uses the illustration of, of Sarah and Hagar to communicate the divergent paths of finding spiritual freedom or enslavement to the law. He's showing each of these spiritual states, that they come from two different families. It would have been easy for you to look at that family and say, well, they have the same father. Well, what Paul is doing here is that they were given to do different things. One is a child of the promise. One is a child of the flesh. They, they have different commitments. One is trying to cling to the Mosaic. One is trying to cling to the Abrahamic in the representation there. See, Paul uses this argument to share that there's a difference between legalism and Christianity. And in this passage, the legalists are the ones that are not the benefactors of the promises because they're clinging to what they can do based on their own flesh. They're not relying upon the spiritual transformation. Friends, do you rely upon spiritual transformation or do you rely upon your own works? Where are you at? Do you believe you belong to the family of God because you do great works or because you have encountered the supernatural power of God and only he could change you? Is it about just being a good person and and doing great things and that's why God loves you and that's why he cares for you? Or is that why you're faithful? Or is it because someone interceded on your behalf and you still need that one to work in and through you for the rest of your life so that you can be faithful to God? Friends, it's so easy for us to drift. Even the song we were singing earlier, our hearts are prone to wander. Friends, even this truth, this reality, we are so quick to wander away from God in this area. 
will drift straight into legalism and it's going to be hard for you to get yourself out of it. As I mentioned earlier, Abraham tried to allow his works to fulfill the promises of God, but God wanted him to rely upon his might. You have to rely upon the might of God. And this is how the false teachers were getting in and they were hindering the gospel from going forward to these people because they were teaching false things. This legalistic teaching. It reminds me of a few times I've been working on a project and there's two types of people in this world. There's the person that comes to a project and they say, where are my instructions? Let me look at the instructions. And there's the other people who are like, let me try to do this on my own. It probably takes you like three hours later, like longer to do it. You're frustrated by the end of it. You break a piece. You're calling the manufacturer saying, I just broke this thing. Can y'all fix this? I need the piece. They're like, well, all the pieces were there. Well, they're really not there. I'm missing one. Well, you broke the one piece because you didn't want to listen. Y'all have had that happen before. You've been working on a project. And you try to, 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 put it, to put it together yourself. But if you would have waited, if you would have been patient, if you would have looked at the instructions, if you would have walked through it the right way, it probably wouldn't have been as hard. See, that's the, the stubbornness in us, the, even that temptation towards legalism there. We want to do it ourselves. We've got to do it our way. We can't wait on something. Friends, in the same way, are we willing to wait on the Lord? That things can happen through his power and his might, transformation can come through him? Are we going to try to bring about things ourselves? Friends, we got to think about this. Because some of us are in situations right now in our lives where you're about to make some decisions on your own work and on your own accord. You haven't even pled with the Father about whether you should move forward with it. You haven't even, you haven't even been trusting him as you're, as you're inching forward in your life. Why? Because you say, I got this, God. I don't need you. You told me the promises. You told me what you have for me. And so I will find my way there. See, this is why legalists struggle to measure up. Because you never do. Because you're trying as hard as you can, and as you're trying to be as faithful as you can, you're getting so frustrated because you never measure up. Well, friends, it was never about you measuring up, but Jesus already measured up for you. See, legalists separate the law, law from the God who gave the law. Don't do that. Well, I, I just got to do these things. See, their, their litmus test is, usually their interpretation of God's standards, not his heart and his desire for his people. So legalists draw a line on what they believe God wants for them instead of asking what God wants of their heart rather than their actions. So your heart shapes your actions. So when God gets to your heart, it is going to shape the way you live. But you can't miss the heart. You need to evaluate the heart. You need to cling to God and what he has for you. This is why legalists are left unsatisfied because they feel their actions aren't enough and they feel very distant from God. Do you feel distant from God right now? Have you been trying to measure up on your own or have you been relying upon him? Have you been resting in his grace? Are you trusting him? Are you more content with giving the the outward exterior image to others that, oh, I got it all together, but you're struggling, you're dry, your bones are dry, you need to be made alive. And that only happens through the spirit. The Spirit's only going to be able to sustain you. So what Paul's saying here is that to the Galatians, I don't want you to, to get captivated by this temptation. Legalism is on the horizon, but don't, don't buy into it. Because we all have a little legalism in us. And we decide what the, the standard for God's rules are, and we will do whatever we can to obey that. And so it's so easy for us to fix our eyes on that, and we miss the heart, our hearts and where it's at with God. Well, I was doing everything right. I don't understand why this is all going wrong, why I still feel this way, why I'm so angry, why I'm so frustrated, why I'm so upset. Friends, check your heart. Maybe you've been focusing on the do's and don'ts to allow you to measure up. It's like a good old checklist. We all like checklists sometimes, you know. You get your checklist for the start of the week and make sure that you obtain these certain goals. Maybe some of us need checklists. That's why you haven't done anything this past week. Um, I joke, I joke, man. Um, so it's, it's this reality. We need a checklist sometimes. But that's what we do with the faith. We make a checklist. We say, well, I'm reading my Bible, you know, I, I, two, three times a week, you know. I, I've been faithful, you know. I got my Bible app. I've been scrolling through. You know, I've, had, like, I, I've connected like three or four days. You know, I'm, I'm really faithful. You know, God loves me a little bit more because, he, cause he, cause I did that. I've been going to, to church. Oh, man, I, I, I've showed up. I've given 45 weeks of my year. I've been there. 
clearly I'm measuring up. I, clearly I, I've done enough. Oh, man, I don't even just show up. I serve. I'm there. I'm, I'm behind the scenes. I'm getting dirty for the glory of God. All praise go to Jesus. But I'm doing that so clearly God sees me as good. Well, community group, I show up. You know, I come to the studies, you know. I sit there. I'm faithful. You know, I might contribute a few different things. So clearly God sees me as just. Friends, that's the legalist inside of you. Those are all great things. I'm not telling you to not do those things. Those are great things. But your heart is what matters the most. Your heart coming to those things is the desire to worship God and to, and to love him. And friends, when our hearts are in a bad place, we'll just talk about doing, doing, doing. I've done this, I've done that, so I'm right with God. But God cares about our hearts and how we're clinging to his promises, his truth. His promises are what guides us into freedom and frees us from the legalistic tendencies of our lives. Friends, are we clinging to freedom? In verses 25 through 26, Paul continues this allegory. He shares that Sarah and Hagar represent two different Jerusalems. Hagar represents the, the present and the physical Jerusalem. It's, the physical Jerusalem is everything that is gathered, built, or boasted in on earth. Members of the physical Jerusalem glory more in what they have done on earth in comparison to the supernatural that only God can do. Think about that. You, you've done so much here. You're building here. You're, you've created here. You've made influence and change here. But all that's pointing back to you what you've done. If it's more about what you've done than what God's done, friends, you're in this, this position of maybe you're more legalistic than what you think. Do you boast more on what God's done or what you've done? This is not saying that what God does shouldn't shape your heart and shouldn't change your hands and how you're engaging the world, but who is getting the credit for it? Are you boasting in yourself? Friends, that might be how you're moving towards legalism. Legalists are more inclined to focus on building the present Jerusalem while believers are focused on building the, the spiritual Jerusalem, the one that sits above, the, the Jerusalem that only God could build and only he could orchestrate, one that's um, showing it, the glory of his kingdom and that the kingdom that only he could build, not that we could build with our hands. See, some of us are, are set on building the kingdom here on this earth. You have a vision for your future, and you will count your vision to build that kingdom over your vision to build God's kingdom. And at the end, you're only going to have the trinkets that you build here, the house, the cars, and you're going to leave those things one day. They're not going with you. But if you invest in a kingdom that the God's are building that sits above, that's connected to his promises, that's going to endure forever. That's an everlasting kingdom, an everlasting Jerusalem that can only be built by the supernatural hand of God. This is why he brings out the differences between the two, because which one are you building? Are you clinging to the promises of God? Are you banking on your own? Are you building for, for here and now? Or are you building for later? We see that even with Jesus as well as he's talking to the disciples. You've got to invest in the internal. Where are you counting your treasures? Where are you laying them at? What is the cost for you? Because there's a cost for us all. See, legalists promote slavery. Christians promote freedom. Do you promote the heart of the gospel or the legalism to those that are around you? Are you seeking to help others rest in the unchanging, supernatural and transformative power of God in all of life? Or are you just telling them the rules of the do's and the don'ts? Are you getting to the heart of the gospel and conversations to move people forward? Or are you just trying to get them to check off a list? See, those who experience the supernatural power of God inherit the spiritual Jerusalem. And that's only going to happen when our eyes are fixed on the right thing. And that's God. In verses 27 through 20, 28, Paul solidifies his argument that Sarah is the mother of of followers of Jesus. He's been making this connection where Hagar is leading the ones into slavery and to submission to the law, but then, then Sarah is the one leading them into freedom. You see here that the people of God have been built through the supernatural hand of God. That's how we're connected even to Sarah. That's the, the fulfillment of the blessings that God's going to make a, a great nation. But even despite all of that, we still have a temptation to want to build it ourselves. Look at the, the verses that he talks about here in verse 27. He says, for it is written, rejoice, O barren one, who does not bear? Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. I want to think about this for a moment. This is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 54, verse 1. Isaiah is, is sharing to Israel that even though 
Their future seems barren. Even though they are exiles in a foreign land, even though the promises of God seem bleak, they should still not stop trusting the promises of God. And friends, this is a, a very helpful moment for us to understand in our contemporary moment because there's going to be moments when Christians feel like exiles in a foreign land where we don't understand what's happening, where we desire for God's kingdom to be brought here because we see the chaos, the destruction, the brokenness in the world around us. Even though the promises of God might seem bleak to you that God's going to bring about his kingdom one day, look up, friends. You can trust. Even though you feel like you are barren, that you're not going to receive the promises of God, you can trust God and hope, knowing that he's going to fulfill his promises. And how do I know this? He gave a stamp for us that in Jesus. Like Jesus came. He went to the cross on our behalf to, to bring about this redemption for us. This is God turning in his receipts to us. This is God saying to us, I'm going to bring about my kingdom. Oh, you feel like it's not coming right now. This week has done that to some of us. We're like, oh man, what is happening in our world? Look up, have hope. God is bringing about his plan. He's going to fulfill his promises. He is a promise-keeping God, and that's the only pathway to freedom. You will only find freedom by trusting the promises of God. Friends, we got to rest in the supernatural work of God because it is greater than the natural. This leads us to point number three this morning. Grace is the vaccine for legalism. Grace is the vaccine for legalism. The aim of this section of scripture is to communicate that grace can free us from slavery. If you ever have had a, a vaccine, um, it's supposed to help you to not get sick. You know, even the idea of me saying the word vaccine like freaks some people out right now. Like, what are you saying, KJ? You complicit right now? I'm not being complicit. I'm just saying the illustration is here, okay? And so this idea we need this, only grace can do this work in our lives that can, can awaken us to who God is so that we can cling to his promises. Grace can free us from the legalism that's inside of us, that, that little tendency in us to, to want to have to do the do's and don'ts for us to rest in the power of grace to change us. Grace is the only possibility for our perspective to change. Grace leads us to rejoice in God since we have been freed from our enslavement. We saw that in chapter 3. We were once slaves, but God has set us free. He has, he's welcomed us into his family. He has adopted us, and he has brought us in. Grace is what you need, friends. We cannot fight the disease of sin on our own. We need the vaccine. We need God to intervene. It's the intervention of God that makes us children of promise. That's why he says there, he says, now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. How? Through what? Grace. Grace is the way that you can become a children of the promise. See, part of Paul's argument is to show how the false teachers are different than those who have received grace. In verse 29, he argues that there will always be tension between the law and grace. There will always be tension between those that are, are falling and living according to the flesh in comparison to those that are living by the Spirit, the, the ones that are clinging to the promises of God. And he gives a great example of this. Maybe you've had some tension, some beef, per se, with some legalists. If you are a follower of Jesus, you've been, why are you trying to hold me down? Why are you trying to add this law to my life when that's not what, what God is calling me to? He's not what he's communicating throughout the scriptures. Genesis chapter 21, verses 8 through 9, paints a picture of the day that Isaac was weaned. Isaac is hanging out, Abraham saying, we're going to throw a party. My boy is going to feast today. You know, he's bringing out the steaks, he's bringing out the crab legs. Well, he's bringing out everything. I don't even know if y'all like crabs. I don't even like crab legs, but it's all right. Um, so he's bringing out the feast. He's laying it out there as they're feasting. I mean, they're grubbing. They're throwing down, you know. They're, they're grubbing. And um, Sarah's hanging out. She's chilling. And she looks to the side. She's like, man, what's uh, Hagar and uh, Ishmael doing over there? And she looks at him. And what, what the text says is that she, they look down on them. And in the original language, it says they had a sense of contempt for them. A sense of jealousy, a sense of frustration, anger, because they were a fulfillment of the promise of God. See, within legalists, it's that tension within them that um, they're frustrated with those that are living by grace because people living by grace are more free than the ones that are living by the flesh. The ones that are living by grace are free to, to live for the glory of God. They're free to enjoy the work of the gospel in their own lives. They don't feel the pressure to measure up, but they feel assurance to, to rest in grace. 
Maybe you felt that contempt on you. Maybe you've been the one that's given the contempt to others, or maybe you've just done it to yourself. Like you're the one, like your inner lawyer is working at you. And so every time you do something, you just tear yourself down even before you can even move forward. Don't allow that contempt to set in, but rest in the grace of the cross. You, you are a, a, a child of freedom. What is chap, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 say? It says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit against the yoke of slavery. You've been freed in Christ. You've been able to inherit the promises of God. So why would you, therefore, then submit yourself to the yoke of slavery? Some of us need to tell our inner lawyer to stop allowing yourself to submit yourself to the yoke of slavery in your life. Rest in God's grace. Well, the situation didn't leave Sarah a happy camper. She ends up sending Ishmael and Hagar out of there. She's like, get, get out of here. I don't want them here. If they're going to look on us with contempt. If they're going to frustrate with us, tell them to go. This is interesting here because it shows that there's a difference between those that are being faithful and those who are not. And this is what Paul's trying to do. He's trying to help us understand this, that the legalists are the ones that should go. The ones that are clinging to the promises of God are the ones that should to stay. And that's why I use this allegory here to help us understand this in this text that we need to, to be faithful to God and follow him, but we should not allow legalism to gain a hold within the church. See, the legalists I know believe if you're not living by their standards, you're not living at all. Could you imagine the pressure of that? How that could build up some tension between both parties, even within churches. That, that happens all the time where people will add an extra biblical law onto something and they expect the entire people to, to submit themselves fully to it. Do you add extra biblical rules to Christianity and abide by them and judge others who do not abide by them? Friends, watch out for the little legalists inside of you because you are tempted to do that. Even in the season where there's so much tension, so much hostility, You'll even be tempted to, to bring up some of your own legalisms yourself. I've seen it all on social media. Well, how you handle yourselves in this moment, how you, how you handle this situation, if you don't do this, you don't really love Jesus. There's like these little legalisms that we're, we're throwing on people. We need to consider it. See, I've witnessed well-meaning Christians draw lines where God doesn't necessarily draw them. And when we enter into that space, we are not placing ourselves above. I mean, we are placing ourselves above the heart of God. If that's you, stop playing God. Rest in God. Rest in his grace. Run to the scriptures. Trust what he has given to us as the source for us to understand what he has for us. You don't need to add to grace to solidify grace in your life. So stop it. See, this is why grace is the only vaccine for us. It's Grace has the ability to take our focus off of ourselves and to place it on God. And in verse 30, Paul describes Abraham and Sarah's response to, to Ishmael and Hagar. And, and he says that they're not going to be the ones that are going to inherit the kingdom, but the ones that are going to are the ones that are, are being faithful to the promises. So this is why Paul is bringing this all together in this last few verses, because he wanted them to know that the false teachers are not the way. They're theologically abusing them. They're keeping them away from inheriting the kingdom. Don't buy into it. They're not the same children of the same promise. For some of us, we look at this and we say, well, that's, that's, could that be harsh? No, he's trying to protect the gospel from going forward in, this, in these people's lives. Some of you have felt the weight of the legalism in your own life and you're struggling right now. Maybe you've been discipled by legalists. I don't know. Maybe you've been influenced by your own inner natural um, temptations there to, to measure up to be a people pleaser. There's good desires there, but you got to rest in grace. Grace is enough. This is why we need to tell the truth of the gospel to all people, because people need to understand the, the true gospel, not a distorted version of it. I've noticed an uptick in people of late actually denying the faith, maybe some popular Christian people that you maybe have heard of before. But one trend that I've noticed in all those conversations is that most of those people have a very legalistic view of Christianity. They marked it off by a bunch of do's and don'ts, but not the grace of God that transforms. And then they missed out on this relationship with God that they need to have that's dynamic, not static, that, that moves in them. That's one that's resting upon the supernatural power of God. See, we need that gospel to go forward. So friends, that's the only way that we can stand in freedom. So friends, we need to stand firm in freedom because we are the captives who have been set free. 
We've been free from the chains of the legalism in our lives, so there's no reason for us to submit anymore to the yoke of slavery. We don't have to worry about measuring up, but we can remember that Christ has already measured up for us. And friends, that is the call for us today. Are we going to fight legalism? Are we going to trust in the supernatural hand of God? Are we going to rest in his grace and mercy? See, friends, today you can fight legalism through the supernatural power of God. You cannot do it on your own. You can't do it on your own accord, but you have to to rest in his grace. Because, friends, maybe some of us are tired right now because you've been trying. Rest in his grace. See, this morning I want to, to challenge all of us to consider where we're at. To consider if we're actually seeking to follow Jesus in all areas of life, are we trying just to measure up or are we actually resting in his grace, asking him to help us, asking him to transform our hearts? Or are we trying to live up to the law, putting ourselves under again under the yoke of slavery? Friends, freedom has come. Rest in it. Maybe you're someone here who is a, not a follower of Jesus and you're, you've been wondering about Christianity, you've been skeptical about it. Friends, I want to let you know this. The, the true gospel is that Christ went to the cross to bring about redemption from our sins, and that that is sufficient enough to provide for us the grace that we need, and that we just need to respond in faith to Jesus and trust him and seek to follow him for the rest of our lives, but we need to rely upon his supernatural work. His supernatural work started when he changed your heart. We need to trust him along the way. Don't try to perfect it yourself, but rest in him. Fight the legalism in your life. So friends, if you haven't started following Jesus, I want to encourage you to follow him today. But for those of us who are followers of Jesus, how are you doing in this fight? Friends, fight the good fight. It's hard at times. It might be a daily battle for us. Probably is in a lot of ways. But we have to fight it. Pray with me. Father, we love you. We're grateful that we're able to come before you, trusting you, trusting your promises, trusting that we know that we can, we can come to you knowing that we don't have it all together, knowing that we're going to mess up, knowing that we're going to make mistakes, but knowing that we can rest in your grace, sit assured knowing that, that you're all we need. So Father, even this morning as we've been dealing with the, the little people pleaser within us, the little legalist within us, I pray that we're able to see that your grace is far greater than legalism and that you can actually change our lives. Father, for the skeptic of, of Christianity or someone who's just outright in denial of the faith, I pray that they would see that there is a true gospel, a gospel that can actually save. So this morning, Father, I just pray that we would just cling to that, that they would submit themselves to you as Lord and that they would trust you. But I pray for the rest of us that we would continue to fight the good fight against legalism, that we would rest in the gospel of grace. We've been set free.